friends searching for a place to fit in. They were going to be on the adventure of heading to start a life together. She was very excited about what the future was going to be for her. But a terrifying crime would bring their adventures to an end. She obviously wasn't killed right away. She was tortured. In their search for answers, investigators must piece together a complicated puzzle of conflicting stories between two couples to determine who is telling the truth and who is leading the conspiracy. He was a quasi kind of a cult leader. He liked to control people through fear. You knew there was more to the story. That's when the uh, the real torture started. It just leaves you with an empty feeling. It's hard to comprehend. area between Redding and the Pacific Coast. It, it's massive in size. It's very dark out there, and if you go down the wrong road, there's trouble. There's a lot of people that actually live out there to kind of keep a distance from law enforcement, make their own rules. It's a place where you can be by yourself and not be bothered. On the morning of April 18, 1998, Shasta County authorities receive a call about a derelict campsite. There was one tent standing. You could see there had been another tent there, but it had been removed. There was debris everywhere. There were empty liquor bottles. There was signs of possibly a struggle or something that had taken place. There was dried blood all around. And that's when then I was notified to start a search warrant. The whole investigative unit was called in. They sent the cadaver dog up with Lee Went to the fire pit. As the investigative unit begins clearing debris, they make a horrific discovery. The police gently dug through the fire pit and eventually they found a hand and they discovered a uh, partially burnt body buried underneath the campfire. The victim was naked. She had a black plastic like garbage bag tied around her head. It definitely appeared that uh, she'd been struck several times in the back of the head. She had bruising though, all over her body. There were cuts on her arms. Investigators immediately contact the coroner's office for assistance. The coroner estimates the body had been there 10 to 15 days, but it was in really good condition for investigative purposes. It was inside the fire pit covered by wood, so it was not disturbed by wildlife or any environmental elements. While the body is removed for autopsy, authorities continue processing the scene for clues. One of the pieces of evidence that we located in the campsite was a small purse, and inside the small purse was a driver's license identifying a person by the name of Lawrence Sinner even though she matched the uh, picture on the driver's license. We want to make 100% sure. Detectives will have to wait for dental records to confirm their victim's identity. In the meantime, the driver's license is the only hint they have. Born on October 25th, 1977, Laura Sinner grew up on a dairy farm near Yakima, Washington, the youngest of three siblings. Laura, as a young girl, she was fun. She was cute. She was always smiling and seemed like happy, even 
when her two big brothers were picking on her. When Laura was eight, her parents divorced. Still, Laura always appreciated the value in family. As she got older, she yearned to help those who had none. I remember Laura high school days. She volunteered a lot with her mom. My mom was very into religion and church and brought us up as a Christian family. It was a, a big part of our life. Mom started doing uh, foster care. She was working in some caregiving fields and then one of her friends, uh, they were following this little boy named Joshua. My sister really took a liking to Joshua and that became a big part of her life. She enjoyed helping others, and that was kind of her Christian spirit, to help others. It was just her personality. Following her freshman year of college, Laura spent the summer of 1997 volunteering at a Christian mission in Aberdeen, Washington. There, Laura would meet the love of her life. There was a young man that uh, had come through the food line, and she kind of noticed that he kept coming through, and there was this young man named Tim. Tim Smith was from Redding, California. He had moved up to Washington State for a change in life when he ended up meeting Laura. Tim was so smitten by her that he started volunteering at the mission so he could get to know her better. They were quite happy with each other. Laura definitely liked Tim. She always wanted to be around him. So she went through the things that we all through when we, you know, meet our first love. By the end of summer, however, the budding romance hit a rough patch. He didn't have any money, was always begging for money from my sister. He just didn't seem to have any drive. They ended up breaking up and it broke Laura's heart. Less than two months later, Laura suffered another devastating blow her mother fell ill. She went into the doctor for that and found out that she had leukemia and it quickly progressed. She went into the hospital October 8th and died on the 31st. So it was like a couple weeks of not knowing she was ill to she's gone. Mom was Laura's life. It devastated Laura. She kind of lost it. Where do I go? What direction do I go? It really threw her a loop. To ease the pain, Laura sought the comfort of her former flame, Tim Smith. I think Laura was emailing him. She had reached out to him, and somehow he figured out how to get her to take him back to where his family was from, and that's where I found out that Redding, California was like his hometown. And that's where she started developing this, well, maybe we could go to California or make a change in her life so that she be could become a happier person. She saw this opportunity with Tim to try something different. In March of 1998, Laura and Tim packed their belongings into Laura's car and headed south to visit her. They're, they're going to go down, meet his family, get married, you know, start a life there. I mean, she was 20. You know, that's kind of what 20-year-olds do. But Laura's happy after would come to an untimely end. Only one month after she arrived in California, police believe they have found her body at a campsite in the Trinity Alps wilderness. We did ultimately find family-sized large can of uh, chili beans. They had hair, blood, evidence, and it was dented. Police suspect that this can was actually used as a weapon on the victim. And with the amount of force taken to make this kind of debt, you can only imagine the level of rage and anger that was behind it. Coming up, as police dig deeper into their victim's life, her family leads them to someone with opportunity. Knowing that he was her ex-boyfriend, he was the one that brought her to the area, he was certainly a person of interest. But a tell-all confession shifts investigators' attention from one couple to re focus on two couples. She came forward to tell investigators that she had information about Laura's death. 
As the autopsy was conducted, it was ultimately determined that the cause of death was a massive, a blunt force trauma. Also, the coroner's report stated that the blood alcohol level was 0.78. The legal limit for being under the influence of alcohol is 0.08. When a person gets to the area of 0.4 to 0.5, they are generally completely incapacitated and anything beyond that there's the extreme possibility of, of death uh, either through alcohol poisoning or just your body shutting down the coroner said that someone would have to be forced to drink that much alcohol because it's physically not possible killed right away she was tortured We contacted Laura's father in Salem to advise him that uh, we had located her body and that she was deceased. Are you sure? Are you sure it's her? I mean, come on. She's too nice. Who would do this? I mean, she'd give you the shoes off her feet, the shirt off her back, the last dollar. Like, this, this is not possible. We were just devastated as a family. My my father was crushed. It was hard for him to, to live with, hearing that that happened to his daughter. Laura's father tells investigators that he had been worried about his daughter ever since she moved to California with her boyfriend, Tim Smith, nearly five weeks earlier. He was so concerned because he hadn't heard from his daughter from the time she left and moved to Reading that he contacted the Salem Police Department and reported her as a missing person. Shortly after that, he received a phone call from her. Laura had called her father to inform him that Tim had actually broken up with her. On March 27th, I emailed my sister and I said, I'm concerned, I know that Tim and you have broken up and I want to help you. And if there's something going on and you need help, let me know. The offer was made by her father to give her money for gas so she could return to Salem. She declined those offers and said that she did want to stay in Reading. Laura's father told investigators that the last he spoke to his daughter was on April 1st. And he hadn't heard from her since then. And he just assumed that she stayed in Reading and that she and Tim were just trying to work things out. Knowing that Tim was her ex-boyfriend, he was the one that brought her to the area. He was certainly a person of interest. Law enforcement locate Tim Smith in Reading and take him into custody. We brought Tim in to major crimes and interviewed him. When police eventually confront Tim and let him know that Laura had been murdered, he seems legitimately shocked. He insists he knows nothing of what happened to her and that the last time he had seen her was March 30th. According to Tim, two weeks after arriving in California, he broke up with Laura following a series of arguments. He described the relationship that he and Laura had and how it changed after they got down to Reading. Tim decided to stay and she was staying at his father's house due to the fact that she actually became friends with Tim's family. She met Tim's brother, Paul, Tim's sister, Lori, her boyfriend, Eric Rubio. They all seemed to get along. Lori and Laura had a fairly instant connection with each other, and Laura wanted Lori to be her maid of honor when she married Tim. Lori felt very close to Laura, 
and uh, once told her that she was like the sister that she had never had. When Tim and Laura broke up, she really had nowhere to go. So she asked Paul and Lori if she could come and live with them. Tim decided he would just keep his distance and let Laura have her space. Or she was excited about these friendships where she had been alone. She had very little in her life after her mother died. When police asked Tim about the last time he spoke to Laura, he claims it's been nearly three weeks. He explains he doesn't spend much time with his younger siblings, 20-year-old Paul Jr. and 18-year-old Lori, because they didn't always see eye to eye. It became very apparent this was a dysfunctional family. Tim tells police that from a young age, he and his siblings had never had a real place to call home. The kids spent most of their time in foster care, bouncing around from one place to another. They weren't always together. It did appear that Tim had moved away, started a productive life, was moving forward. Paul wasn't able to do that. He was in the system, continually in the system, and really struggled to lead a productive life. Even after he got out and became an adult, he continued this type of activity. He was a car thief, burglar, and was involved with that kind of way to support himself rather than get a real job. His sister, Lori, had her own problems in foster care and ended up in juvenile hall a few times also. In late 1997, the family all reconnected and lived underneath Paul Sr.'s roof in Redding, California. The brothers hadn't seen their sister Lori in years. She was almost a stranger, but she reconnected, especially with Paul Jr. Once they reunited, basically as adults, they became very close. They clung to each other. Killed Eric Rubio. At the same time, Paul met a 14-year-old girl named Amy Stevens. My understanding that Amy Stevens was a runaway, that she'd been in the foster care system, and she had ran away at this point, and that she was now hanging out with Paul Smith as, quote, a boyfriend. Paul convinced her to run away from the foster home and move in with him, which she, in fact, did. She idolized him. He was everything to her. Tim says he hasn't seen his siblings since he and Laura Sinner broke up three weeks earlier. Now that Laura has been found murdered, he suggests police should immediately find and question them about the last time they saw Laura. When interviewing Tim, I really, truly felt he was a good guy. I felt he was actually very worried and that possibly some responsibility since he's the one that brought her down here obviously you still have that thing in the back of your mind there's possibility but he was very cooperative as detectives continue to gather information from tim they receive a surprise visit from paul jr's girlfriend amy stevens i'd received a walk-in report of a juvenile who stated that she was hooked up with an adult and he was on a crime spree. She was scared. Amy came forward to tell investigators that she had information about Laura's death. Redding, California, police are investigating the murder of Laura Sinner. 14-year-old Amy Stevens comes forward and claims she knows who killed her. When investigators sit down with Amy, she tells them she had recently met Laura through her 20-year-old boyfriend, Paul Smith, when Paul and his sister Lori offered Laura a place to stay. There were two couples with Eric and Lori and Amy and Paul. She said Laura was kind of disruptive to the group. She was the fifth wheel. She felt that there were times when Laura 
seemed to be flirting with Paul, it seemed like Paul would flirt back with her as well. And this agitated Amy. Amy tells investigators that on April 7th, the group decided to travel to the Trinity Al to join the two couples on the camping trip. Now, Amy admits that she was not happy about that at all. But they set up camp and they were having a good time hanging out. But later in the evening, Laura started flirting with Paul. She said that Laura had kissed Paul and she got very angry. She actually ran up to Laura punched her in the face. At that point, Laura was able to physically push Amy back, and the two of them fell down on the ground, and then Laura was on top of Amy. She told police that then Paul stepped in. Amy described that Paul had grabbed a can, hit Laura in the head. Amy tells investigators she was terrified by what Paul did next. She described that Paul had grabbed a dent puller. Dent puller is a device used by body repair people to pull dents out of a car. It has a heavy end to it. And he beat her with that. Eventually, Paul struck her to the point where Laura was no longer responsive. According to Amy, she was angry when Laura tried to kiss her boyfriend, but she had never meant for her to die. Fearful of Paul, she had stayed quiet about the murder, but her conscience had weighed on her, and she decided she needed to come clean to police. I truly felt sympathy for this young juvenile. She was scared. She just wanted to report this. She wanted something done to Paul Jr., and I thought her motives were pure for reporting it. Amy confirms that Laura's ex-boyfriend, Tim Smith, was not present at the time of the murder, eliminating him as a person of interest. After telling her story, Amy puts investigators in touch with 18-year-old Lori Smith. Lori went to speak with investigators knowing that Amy had done the same thing herself. We just want to talk to you, you know, any arrest or anything like that. And when we're done visiting, we'll be right back. Okay? According to Lori, Laura Sinner had driven her, Eric Rubio, Paul Smith, and Amy Stevens to the Trinity Alps campsite on the afternoon of April 7th. Paul was making his all this drink, alcohol. He was like playing a guilt trip on us. So once he don't drink this, it's messed up because I spent my money on guys buying this alcohol. Lori then explained that ultimately uh, Paul got angry about it. said that she was not helping because Paul had threatened to kill them. He tied her up the rope, the rope around her neck, tied her legs, and tied her arms and threw her on the rest of the map by the tent, and he's almost sliced the rest of the So you make it look like you tried to kill yourself. And he made us watch that. Then he put a bag over her head and beat her more with the dead puller. campsite, Paul had told everyone involved that if they said anything, that uh, he would kill them or have them killed. Lori really believed it. She was in absolute fear of Paul carrying this out, so she hadn't said anything. 
Lori Smith's account of the murder ends the same way as Amy Stevens, but investigators notice some discrepancies between the two stories. The biggest difference was that Amy admitted that she initiated the physical contact. Lori Smith blamed everything on her brother, Paul Smith, and said that he was the one that injured and assaulted and then eventually murdered Laura Sinner. The fact that their stories were that much different made us think we aren't even close to what really took place. Detectives have to wonder, are Amy and Lori telling the truth about Paul? Or are the girls hiding their own motives for wanting Laura Sinner dead? You knew there was more to the story. They decided it was worth investigating Eric and Paul, who is pretty much a loose cannon and a violent person. Coming up, in search of the truth, investigators get a new person. There was lots of contradictory statements, everybody wanting to distance themselves. At no point did I see any remorse. In Redding, California, detectives are searching for two men in connection with the brutal murder of 20-year-old Laura Sinner. Both Lori Smith and Amy Stevens have confessed that their boyfriends, Eric Rubio and Paul Smith Jr., were involved. On April 18th, detectives track the men down. Lori advised us that she received calls from Paul Smith, who was in custody. We checked the arrest log and determined that, in fact, Paul Smith and Eric Rubio were both currently in custody on a car theft arrest. What they were doing were going out. They were trying to steal vehicles, and that's what eventually put Paul Smith and Eric into jail, was they got caught with a stolen Jeep. With the information we had already received talking to the girls, we decided Paul was probably the most responsible about everything took place, so we felt it'd be better to talk to Rubio first. We've been talking to several people, and I understand that something might have happened at the campsite and what campsite might this be. That's so what I'd like for you to share with me. And why are those took place out of the campsite. He was reasonably candid. Eric described their campsite as not a really happy place. There was a lot of drug taking and drinking going on and flirting going on, and tension was rising in the camp. According to Eric, the source of both couples' tension was Laura Sinner. She was really getting on everybody's nerves. Rubio described to us that Amy initially assaulted Laura, punched her in the face, knocked her against a tree. Two of them fell to the ground, and they were wrestling on the ground. Laura started to get advantage on, on Amy. Lori jumped into it because it was believed that Laura Center was winning. So they all fight. Amy went over retrieved this two-pound can of uh, chili beans and then came over and struck Laura in the back of the head two times. Unlike 
Lori's statement that Paul was the initial aggressor, Eric claims that the two girls were the first ones who used the can of chili to beat Laura Sinner. Lori then stepped in, took the can from her because Amy wasn't strong enough to really do any damage. And then Lori struck her multiple times in the head to the point where Laura finally collapsed on the ground and they stopped. Okay, what happened to Laura? She was laying there on the ground. Right. Was she bleeding? Well, she was bleeding when she got up towards the tent and I saw her head. What did you say? Well, just went with gas in her head. According to Rubio, the two girls held Laura up and walked down to the creek, which is about 20 yards away from the campsite. They started rinsing off Laura's head in the water, and it was at that point they could see that the skull was crushing. When the girls returned to the campsite, they left Laura to rest against a tree. Eric claims that's when Paul produced a razor blade. Tied her up and then asked her, out of the blue, from nowhere, asked her, you want to cut your wrist? You want me to do it? Okay, and what did Laura say? She said, I'll do it. Okay. What happened then? So then she did it. She didn't want to do it. She made some, some cuts into her wrist that weren't very deep, which angered Paul. That's when the uh, the real torture started. That, at that point, Paul took the razor blade from her, made the cuts more deeply. Laura was still crying, why are you doing this? She wasn't dying. At one point, Paul grabbed drink the thing because he doesn't want her to feel any more pain. But she drinks practically the entire bottle. She wasn't passing away fast enough for him, so... Lori proceeded to get out and hit her with the dip pour. But I guess to PJ, she wasn't hitting her hard enough, so he took her away from her and told her to get in the tent, and he did it. and Amy were inside the tent trying not to hear the sound of Laura's murder just happening just feet away from them outside of the tent. Finally, they heard a snap. That was her neck being broken. This poor girl was in agony, extreme pain, and unbelievable fear for a very long period of time. It's hard to comprehend. It just leaves you with an empty feeling. He came to the tent, and we all sat there for a minute. And he said, man, come help me bury her. And I was like, no, man, f that. And then he said, man, if you don't help me bury her, man, I'm going to kill you, too. You got up and I helped him there. Are you fearful, Paul? Oh, yeah. Why? Because he's a lot bigger than me, and not only because of that, because he's capable of killing one person, he's capable of doing it again. Unlike Amy and Lori's statements, Eric's account implicates Lori in the bludgeoning of Laura Sinner. There was lots of contradictory statements, everybody wanting to distance themselves. But all three accounts say the same man delivered the fatal blows. Now, detectives turn their attention to the alleged killer, Paul Smith Jr. It was finally time for the police to talk to Paul Smith. So he told the police, just kind of offhandedly, yeah, I'll take the blame for this. for the brutal murder of 20-year-old Laura Sinner at a remote campsite in Northern California. Amy Stevens, Lori Smith, and Eric Rubio all say that 20-year-old Paul Smith Jr. is the real killer. As detectives listen, Paul corroborates Eric's account that the fight had started between the three girls and ended with Paul. In his mind, Laura was not going to live. Her skull was crushed, and that, in fact, she would eventually die. Then he decided he didn't. And then at some point, 
He described that he did hear a snap. Paul told police that he gave each one of his friends an assignment to help him clean up the crime scene. Paul was the type who, it appeared to me, needed an entourage of people to look up to him, think he was their, you know, he was their protector. He was the bad man, not afraid of anything. He was a quasi kind of a cult leader type person, his personality. He liked to control people through fear. That's why he surrounds himself with young people, people that he could intimidate. Amy was in foster care, ran away from foster care. Obviously, Lori Smith had a dysfunctional childhood. Eric Rubio had a dysfunctional childhood, had no one he could really count on. He threatened everyone around him once they were close to him. This guy was absolutely the worst of the worst. But ultimately, all of them were involved in it. And at no point did I see any remorse on the two girls. It's like that pack of dogs. If you have one dog that's a little bit more aggressive, then next thing you know, everybody's attacking. Less than three weeks after Laura's death, Paul Smith, Lori Smith, Amy Stevens, and Eric Rubio are all indicted for her murder. In my 30 years of law enforcement, I don't recall ever uh, arresting uh, multiple couples involved with uh, a murder. On July 10th, 1999, Lori Smith pleads guilty to murder. Eleven days later, her now fiancé, Eric Rubio, does the same. Eric Rubio and Lori Smith made a deal with the district attorney's office to testify against Paul Smith, and that's where they did get a reduced sentence. They were sentenced then to 15 years to life with the possibility of parole. Amy being a juvenile, she went to juvenile court, but she was sentenced to the maximum for a juvenile, which would mean she would be in custody until she was 25. In 2002, four years after Laura's murder, Paul Smith Jr. finally goes on trial. On the stand, he maintains his original statement that his girlfriend... Paul Smith testified that he had only put Laura Center out of her misery because he felt she was going to die anyways from the injuries. That was his defense, that he had done her a favor. The jury obviously didn't buy into that theory, and Paul Smith was eventually convicted on the charges that were brought against him. He was sentenced to death row. I think justice was served for Paul Jr. I don't think justice was served in regards to Amy and Lori. Is it enough for Laura Center's family? Wouldn't be enough for me. There's nothing I could say to any one of them. We've lost our sister, and it hurts 20 some years later, like it was yesterday. Laura deserved better. Laura really trusted people and saw the good in people. And they took advantage of, of Laura's goodwill and good nature. Here was an innocent girl that got caught up with the wrong type of people that it ultimately cost her her life. And that's the saddest thing there is. I love you, Laura. I miss you. See you soon.